we're continuing our study of the restoration principles that make it possible in any time on this earth to have the Lord's gospel and to have the church. God's promised us that the word of God will not pass away. So there's always going to be access to the Bible so that we can learn his will. Of course, we must have the desire to know that will and to do what's necessary to learn it. When you look back at the restorers of the early 19th century in America, then one of the things that they emphasized and they stressed is that you must have respect for divine authority. Christianity is a religion of Bible authority. If you do not respect Bible authority, there will not be Christianity. As an individual, you cannot be a Christian and not respect Bible authority. Of course, implied in that is if you respect Bible authority and all that the word respect means, and the fact that this Bible authority is the authority of God, your creator, then you're going to give the necessary efforts on your part to learn what his authority is, what he's authorized you to do in this life. So it's rather interesting in reading the history of those people as they came out of man-made churches. First of all, they restored the Bible to its rightful place, the only rule of faith and practice. And that's where a lot of their fight was in the early 19th century and even started in the late, very late 18th century. But they preached that since the Bible is the inspired and infallible Word of God, that we must be governed by its teachings and its teachings alone. Now that may sound like uh, not that new to us, but I assure you that particular point is not being emphasized in the churches of Christ and certainly not in the sectarian denominational world as it ought to be. So when they did this, that we ought to be governed by the teachings of the Bible, this meant, and it means the same thing today and will to the end of time, that everything we do in matters religious must be, it's obligatory, it's imperative, must be authorized by the Word of God. So those who sought to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity, they devoted much, much time to the study of the Bible, much prayer full time to the study of the Bible. And specifically, they ask, how does the Bible authorize us to do anything? They came to realize that by having the Bible that God had already established his authority. There it is in the word of God. But how do we study a book that the newest part of it is nearly 2,000 years old? And how do we glean from it only those things that are obligatory on us today? That is that we must do to be safe from our sins and we must do as Christians to be faithful. So they spent a lot of time on that. As I've said to you before, it's interesting to study when Alexander Campbell gave his great sermon on law. And, of course, he was pointing out the main divisions of the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, and that was quite a revelation in that day and time because, frankly, the denominations made no distinction. They recognized it was there, but they really made no distinction between Old Testament and New Testament. So that's quite an interesting uh, read if you get a hold of it. It'll be interesting for you to study that, but it shows us, shows us an example of how they were doing things from, we might say, quote, from the get-go, unquote, and striving to have the church that you read of in your own New Testament. Now, in consideration of how God authorizes, I think there are several matters deserving of not just consideration, but careful consideration. Let's keep in mind that in the Godhead three, first person, second person, and third person, that all original authority is inherent in the first person of the Godhead. There came the time when the first person of the Godhead delegated authority to the second person of the Godhead, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. 
Now, this really is the significant fact that comes out of a study of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those books don't just establish that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. But they're also establishing that therefore, because he is, he has the right to have all authority. We would do well to remind ourselves that when Christ became a man, he became a man even as we humans are, and yet he was also God, God in the flesh. But that meant that Christ being tempted to sin, tempted at every point like as we are, that he could then, of course, be our judge. But also being God, he would see things from God's perspective, perfectly from God's perspective and perfectly from man's perspective. So then when we read our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in particular, we ought to be thinking about the fact that those books in proving him to be the Son of God establish him as the person to have all authority. And these writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, emphasize that Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah. We would do well to remember that all through the Old Testament, that when God officially appointed somebody to an office, priests and kings and prophets, they would be anointed with oil. That didn't necessarily mean there was any municipal qualities to the oil. It just meant that was the way they had of officially doing it. It's sort of like in the New Testament among those people, they had the holy kiss. Well, in our mind, if you think of a kiss, you might think of the Hollywood smooch. Well, it wasn't that at all. It literally means in the Greek a holy touch. And if you want to see it, see it how it's still carried on, in the Middle East, they still do the same thing today. We have a handshake. And therefore, we greet one another, or we even agree to do something, and we shake on it, as we say. Well, that was the way it was in those days. So these writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, emphasize something. They emphasize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one, Christ, Jesus, Christ, anointed, Jesus, Savior, the fulfilling factor of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Christ. We ought to read it with that in mind, that they fit right where they fit because they come at the end of the Old Testament designed to point us to Christ. As such, that is, the Son of God, He is in a position to be the heir of all power or authority. He's the one who has the authority to deal with what concerns us the most, the sin problem. All of this was to make him be able to solve and deal with your sins and my sins. Without what he did on this earth as a man, we would still be suffering from an unsolved problem, the sin problem. Now, we all get concerned about various ailments that come upon us and terrible ones such as heart problems and strokes and cancer and all of that. Well, those are all bad, but after all, we're not going to live in this fleshly body forever, are we? But we are going to exist eternally in one of two places, heaven or hell. Christ came to make a way for us to go to heaven. He could not have done that if he'd stayed in heaven. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And thus Christ came, tabernacled in the flesh, full of grace and truth, John 1 verse 14 and therefore showed us how God would live as a man, how God would deal with things on this earth as a man, and gave us then the pattern to follow in the gospel of Christ. So in Matthew 28, 18, we would expect then the Lord affirmed that all power or authority hath been given unto me, Christ says, in heaven and on earth. Again, remember, that means that Moses, the law of Moses, doesn't have any authority anymore. Whatever authority there was for man under the patriarchal age is not effective anymore. But it's the authority of Christ that concerns us. On the mountain of transfiguration, God made it clear that we should hear His 
son. Matthew 17, 5. Well, in fact, there's a whole host of things as you go through the scriptures. Hebrews really comes down hard on that. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. And Hebrews 12, 25. Making it very clear that Christ is the preeminent one. So we hear the Christ by hearing his revealed word. That's part of the point, if not the main point, I was making this morning. And it's why we're studying what we're studying on Sunday morning in class. So we hear Christ by hearing his word. While on the earth, our Lord promised miraculous inspiration to his apostles. That's the whole tenor of John 14, 15, and 16. And he did this specifically in chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. The record says that the Lord kept his promise. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. We may not realize that in reading through John, in these pa this passage I mentioned, but there it is. He made those promises. He kept those promises. The apostles of Jesus Christ possess the spiritual gifts which were characteristic of the church while in its infancy in the first century. Infancy meaning they did not have the fully revealed and completed New Testament. This means that the apostles possessed the miraculous gift of prophecy. Now this is the very gift by means of which God gives us the New Testament or gave us the New Testament for us to go by. The perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. It simply is the process whereby he revealed his will to man, and in this case, the Christ's will. The gift of prophecy is thus the authority behind every word in the New Testament. Let that sink in. The gift of prophecy is behind every word in the New Testament. The prophets of the New Testament were teachers. We all too often think of prophet in Old Testament and New Testament as one who tells the future. Well, there are predictive elements to prophecy, but the fundamental responsibility of a prophet, whether old or new, is to teach the will of God to men and to point out when they depart from that. Now, in the process of the Old Testament prophets, since things had not happened yet, the Christ had not come and so on, then they would be predicting things in the future because all had not been done yet. But in the fullness of time when God sent forth His Son, Galatians 4.4, 4, then Christ did what He came to do. And when He left, remember, He told the apostles, you'll be guided into all truth. You won't even have to study when you stand before kings and others to defend yourself. It'll be given to you in that self-same hour what to say. Well, that's a miracle. Normally we have to study, and then we hope we remember <laughs> But that wasn't the case in the early days of the church. So, even as in the material creation, everything started by miracle, but continues on through laws. So it is the church started by a miracle, but continues on through the perfect law of liberty. So there are rules, you might say, or laws of spiritual procreation. And thus we see that in the New Testament teachings concerning what one must do to become a Christian and what one must do to live the Christian life. And of course, again, you won't have that view of it if you don't see the New Testament as the final authority. And it is. So they had the gift of prophecy. Now that's how that James or Mark or Luke could write by inspiration. They had the gift of prophecy. How did they get it? They're not apostles. It didn't come on them through the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, because they had hands laid on them. That's determined by implication. And we haven't got a lot of time right now to spend on all that, but nevertheless, that's how that Luke came to write by inspiration, and James came to write by inspiration, and Jude wrote by inspiration, yet they were not apostles of Christ. So the gift of prophecy is thus the authority behind the words of James or Matthew, an apostle, or whoever else wrote. The apostles and the New Testament prophets speak to us in only one way then today, through their word. This is the burden, and you might want to mark this, 
of Paul in writing to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. He is explaining in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, exactly how the Word got to this earth. And he simply says it's through the Holy Spirit. Why the Holy Spirit? Because He is God. He is the revealer of the mind of God. How can you do that? Because He is God. Just like you are the only one that can truly reveal what's on your mind. And if man can understand that, he can understand that it would take God to reveal what's on his mind. Well, it's the lot, for lack of a better way to put it, of the Holy Spirit to do that revealing. So Paul would write, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. And that's what we're talking about. God, the Christ, the apostles, and prophets, and the written word. That's how it came. And that's how we have it today. That's why we can say, James said so and so. Paul said so and so. And yet we know that they're speaking the will of God. And this is Christ by the Holy Spirit through the apostles and prophets speaking to us today. I suggest that needs to be emphasized greatly around us because in talking to people who say the Bible is the Word of God, they don't really understand that. They don't understand the authority of it. And they're liable to deal with it just as sort of a book of suggestions that God sort of put down here that we can live by it if we want to or we don't have to. The written Word then sets forth our obligations. So we need to look at the obligations for a moment. Our obligations, number one, are things in, uh, required. An obligation is that's which is required of us. But there are also those things that are permitted. And there are, there is, there's a difference in things required and things permitted. I don't think we understand that sometimes in classification of authorization. In other words, you have to have authority for what you're to do. We have New Testament authority from Jesus Christ to have this building, to have this land to put the building on. Someone said you can look at an auditorium and by the arrangement of the furniture in it, know pretty much it's, there's something to be said and then there's people out there to listen <laughs> just by the nature of the pulpit and by the pews and the way the whole thing's arranged. But all of this is authorized. The pew you're sitting in is authorized. But you say, how's that so? I never read of such a thing. I never read of a PA system. Never read of air conditioning. You ever read of air conditioning in the, that is the kind we have <laughs> in, the, in the Bible? It's all authorized. Heating system, it's all authorized. How so? By implication. It's that simple. So the Bible authorizes explicitly or implicitly. And if we're going to worship, that demands something. It implies what? A place of worship. But it doesn't just imply a place of worship. It implies a place that is conducive to worship as the worship set out for members of the church to do in the New Testament. Now we could be out there under one of those trees right now. It wouldn't be too bad today. And if we had to, we could go out there right now and worship. We could fulfill our obligation to worship God on the first day of the week. But I'd not rather be in here. Why? The atmosphere, the environment, much more conducive to having your mind upon the singing and the praying and the Lord's Supper and so on. But people for years and years, because they didn't have air conditioning and heating like we do, assembled in buildings that didn't have much heating in the wintertime. And certainly they didn't have any cooling in the summertime. And I remember some of those buildings. First place I preached, I remember. And <laughs> thought of it until just now. It serves a good example, Ken. I remember standing and preaching that thing and they had two fans up on the wall and places didn't even have that. They had taken regular oscillating fans and mounted them to the wall. And they're over there, but they some way never reached up here. Well, they're over there going back and forth. And I remember toward the end of my sermon shifting feet, and I could feel the sweat squishing in the bottom of my shoes. Well, I'd not rather be like I am now <laughs> than I had then. But that has nothing to do with the obligation I must discharge to please God. It has to do with that which is advantageous 
to discharging that. And so is the PA system. And so is all, are all these things. So we need to understand that. It go a long way in helping us understand some things. I, I wish a whole host of elders would realize that their primary duty is to figure out what is the most advantageous way to carry out the obligations. Now, they don't have a right, none of us do as elders or anybody else for that matter, to change the obligations set out in God's Word. But they sure do need to be mindful about what is good, better, and best and what expedites discharging those obligations. And that make a difference in their contemplation, meditation, and prayers when it comes to determining those things. But so with that when it comes to the head of the house, the husband. Or the wife and understanding her role. Or father and mother. What is their obligation? Or what are their obligations? And then once they know them, well, what's the best way to get them done? That's where the expediency comes in. And thus, there are options from which we choose. What are the best options? Somebody said, well, we went on vacation last summer, a year ago. Not this past summer, but a year ago. And we went somewhere, and it cost us X amount of dollars. But, boy, things didn't work that well next year, so we won't be able to take that vacation. Go take a vacation, you say, but you won't spend the money that's coming here that you did last year because you don't have the money to spend that's coming here you did last year. And that determines then where you might go even though you took a voca vacation both years. We do it all the time. It has to do with our education. It has to do with what we do daily. It should have to do with what even the, the job we choose to spend our lives on as to whether those things help us live closer to the Lord or lead us away. So... That's the reason there are a great many things in the Bible that are approved or authorized by God, but they're not always expedient or advantageous for us carrying out the Word of God. That's why if he, uh, uh, Matthew 6.33 comes in, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. There are a lot of things you can do, not wrong within itself, but it takes away from the time you ought to be given to the Lord. It takes away from your study time, and a whole host of other things involved in living faithful to the Lord every day. And that allows us then to grow and to develop and to see where we've come from and where we're going and what we need to do. Not changing the obligations. They don't change. But it's that we grow to see better how to put the Lord first and how to choose things that better encourage us to do the obligation or discharge the obligation. So we herewith set forth what I consider to be an irrefutable proposition. The scriptures teach that in Christian work and worship, we must do only that which is authorized by the Word of God. Now a corollary to that would be this proposition. It is possible for a human being to ascertain that which is authorized by the Word of God. And then an additional corollary to this proposition would be, it is possible for a human being to practice in Christian work and worship only that which is authorized by the Word of God. Now that's in our purview. That's in our ability to do this. We can read. We can understand the Word of God. Paul said to the Ephesians, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, that still works as far as I know. It means we must do what's necessary, called reading. It means we understand the definition of words and so on and so forth. That's how we come to understand. And that has to do with study. So everything the Christian does must be. It's not could be or when we get around to it. But it must be authorized by the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Remember, he is a monarch, an absolute monarch. His word is law. Remember what we said this morning, and he quoted it most often, that if we reject his word, he has one that judges us. What is it? It's the word, John 12, 48. The standard of judgment is the word of Christ. So, we must not go beyond his teaching. We must not fall short. We must not change. And we must not substitute 
Thus, we must not allow what God condemns, and we must not condemn what God allows. We must not violate the laws which God has made. We must not make laws which God has not made. Now, we've been troubled over the last many years of people saying, you don't have to do what God said you have to do. That's loosing where God and His Word has bound. But it's just as wrong to make His Word harder to comply with, more strict, as it is to loose what God's bound. So we don't want to be found legislating for God, whether it's binding where he hasn't bound, or loosing where he hasn't loosed. We just simply want to abide by the authority of God. Now, that takes time. It takes time in studying how to do these things, the nature of language, how language communicates, because God, in making us, accommodated us. Thus, we have the Bible in words that we can understand. In fact, I'm quite sure in God's great providence that he intended the original Hebrew of the Old Testament, some Aramaic that's there, and the Greek of the New Testament to be rendered into other languages. We may not think about it much when we read of it on the day of Pentecost, but the apostles were speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And you see that we understand what they were speaking because the people said, How hear we every man in his own tongue wherein we were born? They were speaking dialects, but they all spoke the same thing. When you read the recorded sermon, which is Peter's sermon, he's standing up with the 11 other apostles, then you read what he said. That means that was being said to everybody in all their languages that are listed there. Read that list of people. And they all said, How hear we this in our own tongues where we were born so it's obvious God intended his word to be translated into the very tongues of everybody the languages of everybody so as we contemplate Bible authority at this time we have in mind the scriptural authority underlying our actions our conduct and our attitude, our mental disposition as Christians. The Bible teaches me the attitude I ought to have toward the Word of God. So even if I have a general understanding that this is God speaking to me and I must abide by His authority and do what He's obligated me to do, as I study that more, I become more and more appreciative of His authority. And now that nothing works well, Without authority. In fact, things can't be done decently and in order without authority. It just can't be. Our actions are the product of our attitude, our mindsets. Our actions grow out of our obligations. All my life as a preacher, and before I became a preacher, and if I wasn't a preacher all my life, there would have been members of the church saying, do I have to assemble every first day of the week and worship God? They do not know what they're revealing to me about their attitude that causes them to engage in such action and manifest such a thought. It's clear then they need some adjustment. <laughs> adjustment in attitude and adjustment in understanding the authority of God is revealed in the New Testament. So our actions are the product of our attitude, and our, atti our actions grow out of our obligations. If you read the Bible and don't see your obligations, your obligations to God, what are you seeing? And yet I think a lot of people read the Bible, and they don't look at it from the standpoint of obligations. Now, over the last 40 years in the church, you had people rising up, mainly from the colleges operated by the brethren, and they wanted to talk about a new hermeneutic. And basically what they did was remove authority from the Word of God. They tried to say it's not a book of rules. It's not a book that teaches you must do this and you must do that. It's simply a narrative. And by using the word narrative, they were silently giving their own definition of narrative. And by that, when they defined it, they said, it just tells you about man's lost condition and that he can't save himself. 
and that God loves him, that Christ died for him, and that man needs to appeal to Christ to save him. And that's it. That is what they came to call the core gospel. And if you've got that, everybody else, regardless of how they worship God and whatever else they may think, then they're all right. We can be in fellowship with every one of them. Well, that destroys what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That the word of God is given by inspiration. Breathed out from God is the idea of inspiration. And is profitable. For doctrine, that's teaching. Well, as far as I know, doctrine sets forth you must do this, you must not do that. It does so by explicit statements and by implicit teaching. So our obligations as children of God relate to one basic point. And that's all. All the obligations that God sets forth for us to do as Christians relate to one basic point. What is it? The salvation of our souls. If you don't study the Bible to learn how God saves you and how this Bible can save you and the attitude of mind and disposition of heart toward the authority of God's Word that was given to save you, then you miss out on everything. You can study it for all sorts of reasons. There are people who know the Greek New Testament far better than I'll ever know it, but they couldn't name the plan of salvation at all. They don't understand the Lord's church. They don't understand its organization, its worship. They don't understand its mission because they don't know how to rightly divide it. You know, remember, all of this about right division of the word was said when everybody spoke Greek. Everybody understood Greek. And there was no such thing as the English language. <laughs> there wasn't any French as we know it. And there wasn't any German as we know it. And certainly no English, as I said. And yet you've got all these warnings in the Greek New Testament to Greek-speaking people and writing people to beware of false teachers. So obviously, simply knowing Greek and writing Greek and understanding Greek as well as the Apostle Paul did doesn't guarantee you will be what God wants you to be. You still had to apply these same principles we've been going over this afternoon in attitude and viewpoint toward the Bible as revealing, revealing the way of, to heaven for each person, or it's not going to do you any good. You can, you can learn a lot of Greek and read a lot of um, Greek works that have come down to us from antiquity. But they're not going to tell you anything but about maybe the person that wrote it or about what he's writing about. You won't learn the will of God from it. You have to go to the book that was given to us for that purpose. That's why inspira inspiration of the scriptures is so important. So let's keep in mind when we study our Bibles, we're studying to learn how to be saved from sin, to be faithful as children of God, that heaven can be our home. Don't study it for any other reason. Now you may benefit in the process of other things, and you might understand some things about history or whatever, but the only reason you need to be studying this Bible is because it tells you your obligations that you must discharge in order to go to heaven. That's why it's here. So the basic obligation of saving souls, notice I said that's the basic obligation of saving souls, involves our subordinate general obligations. First of all, of carrying the gospel of the world. That's our responsibility. And next of all, helping the needy, those that cannot provide for themselves. I think we forget the benevolent work of the church is also designed to save souls. It's not just feed people and put clothes on them. It's designed to show that the child of God is concerned about you and your plight. And you have enough concern to take the time to give it your own means and your own whatever to help that particular person. Remember how James by the Holy Spirit described pure and undefiled religion? To visit the widows and orphans and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's a part of it. And beware the people in the church who are so pious, they don't think the church collectively 
can practice pure and undefiled religion. But not only can the church collectively do so, each member should. And when each member should, the whole church does. James 1, verse 27. Then there's the edification of the church, to edify. We don't use that word a lot except directly connected with uh, the church. It means building up spiritually. What we're really doing right now, most of what I'm saying today to most of you is not new. But even Peter said, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. We need things. We need them to learn them. Then we need to be reminded of them. So we're busy in saving souls by helping those who can't help themselves, James 1, 27, and by edifying one another and causing us to remember the truths we've already learned and going on deeper into the knowledge of the truth. And carrying out these subordinate general obligations involves a multiplicity of specific tasks. And as to whether or not we will meet these obligations, by the way, if we expect to please God, we don't have any choice. But with reference to how, let me underscore that word how, how we meet these obligations, there are areas of choice. And that's important to understand, is how we meet these obligations. That's where the elders over the church determines what's the best way to discharge an obligation. And you individually must determine what's the best way for you to discharge your personal obligations to God. And as a husband, head of the house, you've got to figure out what's the best way for you to guide that house in discharging the obligations a home has. And so is the woman to guide the home. So you've got to figure out those things. And God's left it up to us to do that under the general teaching of, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in applying those particular matters. So we need to stop and think about how are we going to do this. We know what to do, but how are we going to do it? That's a difference, you know, in knowing what to do and how you do it. So that's left up to us a great many times to choose how we do it, such as going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's the obligation? To go, to preach, to preach the gospel to every creature. No choice in the matter. That's what we're to do if we want to please God. But then how we go is another story. In my going, I've gone by car. I've gone by walking. I've gone by ship. I've gone by air. Is there any other way I've gone? There probably has been. I can't think of it. But anyway, I've gone according to what um, modern transportation has allowed me to choose to go. I certainly wouldn't want to walk to Africa. I don't think I quite could walk all the way to Africa. So uh, nowadays, I can walk a ways, ride a ways, fly an airplane and ride in that, land and go somewhere like that. Couldn't do that in 1890. But the obligation to the church was still there. But it didn't have so many options to choose from as to how they would carry it out. Those things will always be upon us. We're seeing now in the last few years uh, all sorts of ways to teach the truth when it comes to the Internet, when it turns to all sorts of things like that. So we must have those things in mind. So how is Bible authority ascertained with reference to what our obligations are? How is authority set out to us with reference to how we're to meet these obligations? In striving to answer this question, we're working within the field of what we know to be biblical hermeneutics, the tools whereby you, when employing those tools, you find out what God's authorized you to do. They would be literary skill, skills when it came to the study of the Bible. Certainly within so short a time as this right now, I'm not going to be able to go into all that. We, we've got whole classes we've taught on ascertaining Bible authority, but it still needs to be said because if you're going to have the gospel and the church on this earth, you've got to know how to ascertain the authority of Jesus Christ from his last will and testament. If you don't know how to do that, you cannot restore the church. You just can't. So we can only suggest certain basic matters, and I'll try to do that at a later date. I hope this afternoon what I've been able to emphasize, not because it's new to most of you, it's not, but to cause you to think about still how important it is that in studying the Bible we learn what study really means and right division of the word, what the right division of the word really means, and that it pertains to our understanding language how language works, and how we understand 
any word is a vehicle of thought or a sign of an idea. But today we close our study right now of the restoration principles. And we offer this opportunity to anybody that's not a Christian to become one. You can still, because of the authority and power of God's word, become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the Lord's church. You don't have to be a member, and you should not be a member of any man-made church. And if you are, you ought to get out of it. You ought to be a member of the Lord's church, and the only way people become members of the Lord's church by obedience to the gospel of Christ, God's power to save you from sin, Romans 1.16. To believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God, and complete your obedience to Him by being baptized into Christ. You're raised then to walk in newness of life, a new creature added to the church by the Lord to live your life under the authority of our great King. And He will welcome you home when time is no more. As a child of God, if you've been stepping out from under that authority by neglecting it, whatever way you may have done so, we urge you to repent of those things, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And so you have that opportunity now if you need while we stand and while we sing.